Welcome to Speaking Freely with the ACLU of Pennsylvania. I'm Andy Hoover, your host and Director of Communications at the ACLU of PA. Libraries are a critical institution for supporting the freedom to read and freedom of thought. In the United States, libraries have been terribly underfunded for years, and now they're being targeted by extremist activists for fulfilling their fundamental mission to promote access to ideas. Library Freedom Project is challenging that and working to maintain the library's place in our democratic society. In this episode, I'm joined by Allison Macrina, Director of Library Freedom Project, which works to protect information democracy. In our conversation, Allison explains how the organization fulfills its mission by creating a network of like-minded librarians. Allison also gives tips for how everyone can push back on attempts to curtail the work of their local library. This conversation was recorded on May 11th. Well, Allison, thanks so much for taking the time. Really interested in diving into uh, what the Library Freedom Project is and what you do in your work, um, because there have been so many clashes in so many places. Um, so thanks for taking the time to talk with me today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So let's start there. Uh, you, you're the director of the Library Freedom Project. Uh, what is the mission of your organization? Our mission is that we're radically rethinking the library professional organization by creating a network of values-driven librarian activists acting together to build information democracy. So that's like our, you know, website version. What that means in practice is that primarily what we do is we offer education and training for librarians about how to live our values, the values of librarianship in practice and also how to connect our work with all kinds of other things happening in our communities, other issues of social justice, things having to do with, you know, a broken social system, um, as well as the rest of the world around us. So we do this uh, in addition to our education and training programs. We also build a lot of community between and among librarians who care about these issues, who are doing this work and who need each other basically for solidarity purposes because times are hard out here for public servants and we really need one another to keep this work going and also just to take care of each other. So tell me a little bit about what that looks like then in practice. What does what your daily work look like? We have a small staff of three. Um, it's me and two other people, one focusing on outreach, one of them focused on fundraising. And most of the work that we do is centered on those direct trainings for librarians. So primarily we focus on like two main issue areas, intellectual freedom work, as well as privacy work. There's a lot of other stuff that's kind of combined with it. I like to refer to it as information democracy meaning that like people should be able to access the information that they need, you know, with without any barriers to it and with various protections as needed. Um, and w within kind of uh, wanting to create the, the positive side of that to create those access points, we also recognize what are the threats to it? You know, why do we not really have information democracy? What are the things that make challenges to realizing that kind of dream? So specific things that we do, you know, mostly it's virtual and in-person trainings. So I'll just give you one example of one that we have upcoming that I think really speaks to the nature of the work that we do. We're hosting a training on power mapping and open source intelligence gathering with the director of a really cool organization called Tech Inquiry. So essentially what, what it means, power mapping, open source intelligence, it's looking at the networks of money and associations among the powerful and looking at this like in all sorts of ways, you know, tech inquiry focuses their work on a lot of corporate influence, big government agencies and things like that. But you can use these techniques for all kinds of ends. So the reason that we want librarians to have these skills is a couple of reasons. One you know, we we, I, we see librarians as a really good avenue for helping to train the public around information democracy issues. So in other words, if you give librarians the skills to do open source intelligence gathering, if you teach them about how to find these power relationships, 
you know, between and among these, these entities, they can then teach others. But the second piece of it is that we're, you know, human beings living in that world too. We need those skills for our own ends. And so there's a lot of ways that we can use those kinds of skills for like, you know, building our unions, for example, or, um, you know, fighting against some of these adversaries that we're seeing attacking public institutions like the libraries. So, you know, all, all different kinds of trainings focused on skills that you kind of can't really find anywhere else that are all in support of this broader theme of information democracy. We also have a lot of in-person meetups, um, doing the same kind of trainings, offering the same kind of like material in person, but also as a means of creating some more of that solidarity. That's a really big thing for us is building our community, recognizing that librarians are human beings first, that we are, that we're all coming off of, you know, having to be public servants working in a pandemic um, and all the stress and fear that we had over the last few years is now not gone um, because we've moved into a totally different fight, which is, you know, rejecting um, right-wing reactionaries that are trying to close our doors. So creating in-person meetups as a way to like be in community with each other, be in solidarity and help support each other through these times. Other things that we do in our day-to-day -day is we build a lot of resources around these issues. So like flyers and uh, slide decks and posters and other things that can help us to teach and also can be like passive ways to to teach others in our libraries. And then of course, like, you know, we do a lot of research and reading about these issues as well as like building our broader network of other people who are aligned on this stuff. So activists, organizations like the ACLU, um, tech people, labor organizers, you know, all sorts of fellow travelers who we always have stuff to teach one another. So that phrase information democracy really starts to scratch. It's something I want to ask you about. You know, the library has been an institution that's been around for centuries. Um, what do you feel is the role of libraries today? And you're, you're starting to, you're getting into this a bit, but what part does a, a library play in a democratic society? Well, it's, it's such a big question, but I think, you know, thinking about this, like in a society that we want to be as democratic as possible, but unfortunately it's becoming less and less. So I think just at the very basic level, having a space like the library, not just the public library, but even academic libraries that are a little different in their purpose, it still is a free public space. We don't have a whole lot of free public spaces. In fact, I think the library might be kind of the only free public indoor space that exists. So even just that alone, I think when you think about it, it's a pretty radical function in a democratic society and is like at the core of what it means to have a democracy. Um, you don't have to buy anything. You don't have to do anything. It's one of the only places that you can just go and be. Uh, one of the aspects of that I think is particularly unique is that it's public space that is not means tested. So most of our social programs that to the extent that they exist in the United States are aggressively means tested. So only the poorest of the poor can get certain kinds of social services. And there's been all sorts of criticism of this that like, you know, first of all, that's not enough for poor people because you have to be like so abjectly poor to access those services that most of the people who are struggling can't get to them. Um, but also that like social services should not be means tested because everyone should be able to enjoy things that we all pay for. And when things aren't means tested, when middle class and even wealthier people get to enjoy them too, frankly, they tend to be better. So that is something that I think is really special about the library, that it's for everybody. It's supposed to represent all of the you know, the rich tapestry of our society for better and worse. And so like its fundamental existence is democratic. And then I think like thinking about that more specifically, you know, as a space in the current information environment that we're in, an environment that is rife with so much misinformation and disinformation, 
from the highest sources from like allegedly or supposedly or previously trustworthy sources. I think the library is really special in that not only does it provide all kinds of information and we're always trying to think about like what else is out there? What do our patrons need? But it can at its best, I think, be a bulwark against some of that really, um, you know, the pervasive bad kinds of information. So you've alluded to this here as we've been talking, um, mm. but I definitely want to ask you a bit about what you see as the threats right now to libraries, because it seems like they are numerous. Well, the number one biggest threat is that public libraries, academic libraries, and school libraries are under a coordinated right-wing assault. Um, it is both at, I say that it's coordinated, even though sometimes this takes the form of individual actors who are maybe like poisoned by the likes of Tucker Carlson or similar type pundits. Um, but it goes all the way up to your typical anti-public resource billionaires, like the Koch brothers, like the Bradley Foundation, other big money sources like that. And the form that it's taking is so varied. I mean, the one thing I will say about our adversaries is that their organizing is incredible. Um, you know, they have made this it's basically been a 50 year project of trying to destroy public space. And what's been happening at the library level in the last few years is using uh, anti-gay, anti-LGBT, anti-trans rhetoric, as well as anti-black, anti-immigrant rhetoric to take away resources from the library. So we're seeing this in the form of a ton of book bannings, um, this is what we've really seen, like, especially at the school level, but it's happening at public libraries all over the place. We're seeing a lot of attempts at takeovers of library boards and school boards by people who are against LGBT materials and curricula, but more broadly are actually against the existence of public libraries and public schools. And then we're seeing it, you know, at the legislative level. I mean, you know, I don't need to tell somebody at the ACLU what's happening with statewide legislation, you know, that even though a lot of these attempts at passing new laws about obscenity, about so-called parents' rights, about so-called protect the children, even though many of them fail, that is not a deterrent to these adversaries. Um, one example that I like to share when talking about this is in Virginia recently, a bunch of these bills failed. And I was reading about them because I had gone to Virginia to speak to some public library directors. And one of the legislators who had introduced these bills, you know, after his, his they failed, he seemed like actually kind of chipper. And he said to the reporter, he said, you know, we're not deterred by this. We're going to keep going. We're going to appeal. We'll try some other avenues. What he said next really was what stunned me. He said, Dobbs failed all the way to the top. So we're going to go all the way to the top. And of course, he's referring wow. to, you know, uh, reproductive rights legislation. And he's he's absolutely correct that the higher up you go, the more likely you are to hit um, an ultra conservative judge and maybe get your way about this stuff. So, you know, that's really the biggest thing. But it's a part of a whole environment of, you know, attempting privatization of public resources, of defunding the public sector in general, especially, you know, trying to take libraries away. Um, the whole misinfo and disinfo environment and just generally being in the lovely 2023 world of like, you know, favoring corporate interests over public interests. I asked you about threats, but it's dawning on me that I should ask you about wins and, and <laughs> positives um, because I'm thinking back, I don't know, maybe it was a year or two ago, there was a fight in um, Southern Pennsylvania, I believe it was in Franklin County, um, or maybe Fulton County, where a library hosted, um, pretty sure it was an LGBTQ community group, and the local commissioners were threatening to pull their funding, but then after much community pushback and some private funding, um, which came in, um, they beat back. They beat it back. Um, you want to tell us about some wins? You want to tell us about like, and maybe like if anybody out there is facing a threat, um, whether it's through whether it's a threat to funding or it is. 
uh, a book ban, materials ban. Um, what are your tips um, for how to how to push back? Well, the number one thing is that when we show up with our people, we always win. I mean, that's the takeaway. I wish I had come prepared with a few like specific examples of places like names. I don't have those, but I promise if you if you just do a quick search, actually, I'll give a resource that I think has been doing a, a fantastic job of tracking these fights is the website Book Riot. Um, they have been really on top of the censorship and intellectual freedom environment and also doing a good job of cataloging the win. But, you know, again and again, we've seen that when we, and I mean librarians, teachers, civil liberties advocates, when we show up with our people, when we build our coalitions and go to the board meetings, when we go to protest or to counter protest, when there are, you know, um, things like against story time and whatnot, when we show up with our people, we always win. Because the thing to remember is that this opposition, while it is a very organized movement, it's not a big one. It's not a popular one. No. Um, what we, yeah, and what we lack is just people really being aware of what they can do and where they can help. Another project that I'll plug is one uh, that is being run by an amazing organizer named Miriam Kaba. It's a project called For the People. And what they're trying to do is get values aligned folks to run for library boards, to show up at board meetings. And they have really fantastic resources about like you get to the board meeting and what do you say? You know, so here's a script for you. So helping people because people are shy, they don't know, you know, and they and they're afraid to go up against like aggressive opposition forces who are frankly often pretty threatening and can be directly threatening to our community members. So um, there's a lot of really amazing stuff out there for helping us to figure out how do we how do we show up and what do we say when we get there. So it's apparent on your website that privacy is one of the values of the Library Freedom Project. There's a privacy scorecard for library vendors. There's a quote from Edward Snowden. There's a buy by Facebook postcard. Um, what, is, what is it about libraries and, and privacy? What's the connection there? It's a core value of librarianship, privacy is, I mean. And the reason that it is is because we recognize that you really can't have intellectual freedom without privacy. And more broadly, you can't have information democracy, you know, without having as much weight to both. And by this, I mean that if you don't have the space to read, write, research freely, you can't really have intellectual freedom. If someone is watching you, if you are um, being censored by someone, if there is some kind of um, more powerful entity that is monitoring what you do, you're gonna self-censor. And so most of our work prior to the current intellectual freedom fight that we're in now, most of our work at Library Freedom Project was focused on privacy. And so bigger than just the kind of basic core values issues, we recognize that um, poor and working people in the US are the most under threat for their, you know, their privacy being at risk because they have, um, you know, various social service agencies that are monitoring them in order to qualify for getting resources, you often have to reveal a lot about yourself. Um, obviously, the police have surveillance technology that, you know, it, the, the likes of which the world had never seen 20 years ago. And I know that the ACLU has done a tremendous amount of work on particularly, you know, policing and surveillance. Um, beyond that, you know, the uses of artificial intelligence in our lives, all kinds of predictive decision making. You know, there are all sorts of ways that our privacy is both threatened and also how our data is like traded as a commodity. And so we in Library Freedom Project try to break down these high tech issues in a way that regular people can understand. Again, thinking about the librarian as like a conduit for helping to educate members of the public you know, letting people know that their privacy concerns are totally valid, that they're not dumb because they don't understand computers, that computers are hard to understand, and that this technology is not even necessarily understood by the people who make it, um, that like the whole kind of black box algorithm is a real thing. Um, and then also recognizing that, you know, a lot of other social justice issues that we care about in the world have privacy angles. So thinking, for example, of 
reproductive justice. You know, there's a major privacy issue there that like the issue of rep your reproductive rights is an issue of medical privacy as it is, but also because of the way that reproductive rights have come under threat in this country, that just the, the, the act of seeking reproductive information is something that a person needs privacy for, that offering reproductive services is something that providers need privacy for, um, and also recognizing that a lot of those reactionary adversaries that we have are using surveillance techniques to monitor people who are on our side. And I'm talking about things like doxing, which is the practice of publishing someone's personal information online without their consent and using it to harass them or to, you know, to, to create some kind of terror in their life. Um, so, you know, we try to cover a lot of different issues that are valid to our communities with regard to privacy and surveillance. So you've mentioned schools, and they are a real flashpoint in these conflicts um, that we're having now over access to materials, books by and about LGBTQ people are under threat, books by and about people of color often are as well. Um, what's your advice for school librarians and people who support diversity in school libraries? I think the first thing is to get to know what the threats are and who the adversaries are, because I think there's a lot of there's a lot of misinformation and lack of understanding that this is an organized movement, that it does have funding um, from your typical far right funding sources. A lot of it is connected to both Coke money and um, just a lot of far right Florida politicians, the whole kind of DeSantis network. So understanding who the people are and how well organized they are near you, like before anything even happens, hopefully folks listening are not experiencing some of these threats in the immediate sense. Um, so getting prepared because it unfortunately might only be a matter of time. And that doesn't matter what part of the country you're in. We're seeing this happen in every type of community in the most conservative communities, but also a lot of this stuff has happened in like super blue Massachusetts. Um, one of the story time attacks that happened um, when when Proud Boys showed up at a Pride story time was in San Francisco. So recognizing that it could happen where you are and getting to know who the adversaries are. And then beyond that, you know, for the for folks who work in the schools, for the school librarians and for the teachers, as well as like PTA members and people who have more access like that, making sure that core values of civil liberties and human rights are built into the policy. So not shirking from, you know, being upfront about being pro LGBT and, you know, having material about racial justice, you know, recognizing that like our adversaries want us to stop talking about those things. And so we can't stop talking about them. We have to talk about them louder um, and we have to live them instead of just talking about them. And then, you know, building coalitions of other people who support us, recognizing that there are tons and tons of parents and librarians and teachers and neighbors who are watching these things happen and who are horrified by them and want to help. So figuring out ways to connect with who your people are and also knowing, like I said before, that as soon as you build those coalitions, that's when we win. So what the ask is when we have our coalitions together is showing up at board meetings, showing up to support the school um, before anything happens, but definitely if things are happening. Um, and then also showing up against these legislative fights, because that's something that I think, um, you know, school teachers and school librarians are a little hamstrung about because they can't, you know, they're, they're public service workers, they can't easily talk about that legislation on their own. It has to be some other entity. So this is a perfect way for allies to get involved, for parents, you know, showing up at legislative days, writing letters, doing public comment, using all the amazing resources that the ACLU has about getting involved in the political process. Um, that kind of stuff can really, really help. So, Allison, this is really great information. I really appreciate your insights. Where can people go to learn more about the Library Freedom Project? Our website is libraryfreedom.org. Um, we are on Twitter, 
and Instagram. And also anyone who is interested in getting involved in our work can just contact us directly at info at libraryfreedom.org. Awesome. Thanks, Allison. Really nice to talk to you. Thanks so much. Great to talk to you too, Andy. That's Allison Macrina, director of the Library Freedom Project. You can find them online at librayfreedom.org and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle at librayfreedom. That's a wrap on episode 81. The editor of Speaking Freely is Natalie Montero. Our opening theme is by Moody Finn and our closing theme is by Elliot. Both are courtesy of bensound.com. The acting executive director of the ACLU of Pennsylvania is Claire Landau. I'm Andy Hoover. Until next time, be free. Be free.